Essential Enthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about syllables. But first, Gretchen's book is out now, and if you haven't bought it yet, you should buy a copy. Yes, it's very exciting to finally have other people being able to read the book and talk to me about memes and emoji and punctuation and all of the internet linguistic things that I've been thinking about for three years. Uh, we are doing a very special Q&A episode for the book. This episode goes up on August 15th. You have until August 15th, so you have some number of hours until it is no longer August 15th in any time zone. So you can check ahead to Hawaii and maybe gain a few hours that way uh, to send in your questions about things to do with internet linguistics or the book writing process, and then we'll do a very special behind-the-scenes bonus episode about that. I'm looking forward to everyone else's questions. I have a bunch of questions about how the book writing process went. I'm looking forward to that Patreon bonus episode. Also on the Patreon, we have a new $15 plus tier. Several people have been asking for a way to support us even more than the $5 a month for bonus episodes. And at our $15 Lingfabet tier, you will receive your very own symbol of the International Phonetic Alphabet, which you can get through either a super scientific quiz or just merely saying that you have a favourite. And then we will add your name and symbol of choice to our Lingthusiasm Supporter Wall of Fame on our website. And we're happy to put your name or any other name within reason. So if you want to give this as a gift to somebody, that's also a thing you can do. And if you join this new level before August 15th, this is the same time zone uh, thing that you're running into right now, you can also get a signed book plate, which is a custom Because Internet sticker that you can stick into your copy of Because Internet, which I will sign for you and I'll put your name or whatever name you want, and you can stick it inside your book and then you have a signed copy of Because Internet. So if you join that very soon, uh, you can get that as well. Of course, even if you don't listen to this episode within the first 24 hours of it going up, you can still buy Gretchen's book from all good and bad booksellers, preferably good ones. <laughs> and you can also support us on the Patreon. Yes, and uh, there are some other ways to get an actual physical copy of the book signed, but this is probably the easiest one, so hopefully you have a chance to do that. Gretchen, I am going to test you and okay. everyone can play along. I'm going to give you some pairs of words and I want you to tell me whether they sound like English words. Okay, sounds good. They're made up, some of them. but uh, So the first one is blick and benick. Blick sounds like a pretty reasonable English word. I don't know what it means yet, but it could mean something. Benick, I'm not so sure. I actually even have trouble saying it. I feel like I'm saying but nick. But Nick. But Nick. All at once. B N I C K. Not something I'd expect English to turn into a word, no. No, the the B and the N together don't really work that well. Um what about the word copter versus the word pter? Yeah, copter, I mean, is an existing English word, could continue to be an existing English word, seems legit to me. Pter Yeah, the the P T thing, again, not not really doing it for me. Because that's the like when you say pterodactyl. I know that it's P-T, but I can never say that P. Yeah, or like the Greek Ptolemy is just Ptolemy. It's not Ptol Ptolemy, even though that's like how they said it back in the day. In fact, helicopter is from Greek helicopter, like uh, spinning and flying are the two roots there. It really seems like it should be from heli and copter, yep. but it's helicopter. Which is not how my English brain can divide that word up. No, no, it really isn't. But the Greeks are really happy to have pter. Okay, next two are sneeze and sneeze. So sneeze seems like it's doing fine, but with the F, sneeze? I'm really glad that you recognize sneeze as a word. We're doing well. Good work. <laughs> My vocabulary is, is really good. I know the words helicopter and sneeze. Uh, but yeah, sneeze, also not so much. So sneeze was the original way that English speakers said sneeze. That is amazing. And then when they started printing it, that F looked like that long S that you get in old ye olde printing times. And people started pronouncing it much more sensibly as sneeze, because like, we don't have any words in English that begin with fn. Yeah, we literally had like three of them, and two of them are now gone, and people turned fneeze into sneeze, because it <laughs> felt more like the shape of an English word. Okay, next one is sing versus ngis. 
Sing, again, an English word. I recognize it. Phew. Seems very English word-like. <laughs> but ngis, I don't think we have any English words that begin with nga. Uh, no, but we do in uh, languages like a lot of Australian languages, and also Shuba, the language I work on, has that initial nga sound. And I, even though I know this, I really struggle to pronounce it because it's not where it goes in English. We have it at the end of a word. I know I can make this sound, but I really struggle to make it at the start of a word. Yeah, and you have it in like Vietnamese at the beginning of words and Cantonese, I think sometimes you see it in people's last names, but not at the beginning of words in English. And the final pair is heat and tih. Heat, also an English word, seems like it works. Teh, tih. With the H at the end, I, I can make it, but it kind of reminds me of when I was studying Arabic and I had to learn how to make words that ended with an H sound, because that's not where we're used to saying it in English. Even if you write an H, like, ah, uh, you write it with an H, but you don't say, ah, uh, <laughs> unless uh, yeah. you speak Arabic, maybe. So H's, H goes at the start of a word for English, N goes at the end of a word, and when you try and put them in the other spot, it's really hard to say and it's really hard to hear as well. Yeah, and that's something that I find really interesting because when we think of the sounds of a language, it's easy to be like, okay, like here's a list of the sounds of a, in this language. But it's not just about which sounds you have, it's also about how you can combine them with each other. Which ones can go at the beginning of the word, which ones can go at the end of the word, and not all languages let you do all possible combinations. And that's because different languages have different structures for their syllables and what sounds can go together in a syllable, which is like a chunk of sounds together. Yeah, and then a word is made up of syllables, and that kind of determines what, what you can do. So if you talk about words that are just one syllable long, that kind of gives you the maximal picture of what sounds can combine like in that language. Yeah, so what sounds can combine and what spots they can go in within that structure. And in fact, the word syllable comes from a Greek word that means goes together or what goes together, which is a really nice – I kind of like that, that syllable is like – it means what can be – what can hang out together. Oh, that's very nice. Also, just to clarify, we're not talking about sign languages here because sign languages don't have sound-based rules for how they go together because they don't have sounds. They're not stuck with this narrow-minded problem of linear time in the way that sounds are when they all have to follow a string. Yeah, sounds only exist in one dimension, signs exist in two dimensions, uh, so they've got their own constraints and we're just not going to get into them in this episode. Yeah, so different languages have different shapes for their syllables, or different ways they like their syllables to be constructed. I like to think of a syllable as kind of like a burger. Awesome. <laughs> it's a very delicious metaphor. I'm sorry if anyone is hungry right now. And so you have your pieces that go together, like the, the patty and the bun and the various toppings and cheese and so on that you might add to your burger. And there's various different kinds of ways you can do that uh, when you're looking at the syllable burger as a whole. And different languages allow you to put different things in the burger and in, in different orders. Yeah, and some people, you know, there was a lot of controversy about the, the burger emoji a while back because people were annoyed that uh, some versions of it had, like, the cheese below the meat instead of on top of the meat. And so, you know, there's the order is important when you put things in a burger. <laughs> and what you include and how much you can include in a burger definitely varies from place to place. Yeah, and it can be political sometimes. Like, I don't know what you guys put in burgers in Australia that is different. Well, a classic Australian burger has beetroot in it. Oh, okay. See, I would definitely not think of beets as a thing you put in burgers. It's delicious. I, it probably is. I've never tried it. <laughs> but languages are also often faced with syllables that they can't necessarily handle through their own internal resources, and then they have a couple options. And one of those is to say, okay, there's so much here that I'm actually going to split this across two burgers. And another of which is to say, look, there's so much here, I'm just going to take some stuff out and completely discard it. Right. Uh, one very salient example to English speakers sometimes is when Spanish borrows a word from English. Uh, so in English, you can start a syllable with a sequence of sounds like sp or sk mm -hmm. or str. So you can have an S and then a consonant or some, some consonants after it at the beginning of a syllable in a sequence like sprite or school or scheme or street uh, or in a name like Stephanie. But in Spanish, this combination of S and a consonant at the beginning doesn't work. You can have just S at the beginning, but you can't have S and then a consonant at the beginning of a syllable. It's just not, not something they're keen on. So the way that they deal with this is they say, okay, if you try to put 
S and then a consonant at the beginning of a syllable, you're going to add a vowel in before the S. So now the S belongs to the previous syllable and the consonant belongs to the next one, and you've split them across two different sorts of burgers. <laughs> um, and so you get things like Stephanie becomes Estephanie, mm -hmm. or Sprite becomes Esprite, or School, which goes back to the Latin root Scola, becomes in Spanish Escuela rather than Scuela or Scola. And so, you know, in all of these cases, you're adding the, the E at the beginning to kind of rescue this S and allow it to stay, because otherwise it's not something that works for speakers of that language to pronounce. Nepali speakers do the same, but instead of E at the start uh, for their burger, they use an E burger. So it's E school instead of S school. Hmm. Kind of a similar, they don't like S and K in the same burger, so they move the S over to another little burger with an E. And it's kind of like, I like to think of the, the vowel in the middle is kind of like the, the meat or the patty or the, you know, portobello mushroom in the middle of the burger. Mm -hmm. And then you have like your consonants on the other side, which are kind of like the buns. Yeah. And so it's like, no, we've got too much bun. This bun is too big. We need to give it its own patty, its own vowel, uh, by adding an extra vowel. Uh, another example of this is, so Hawaiian, which is really the largest syllable that it will let you have is just a consonant and a vowel all by itself. And so when the expression Merry Christmas was borrowed into Hawaiian, it got converted into Mele Kalikimaka. And so Mary becomes Mele, because they don't have an R in Hawaiian, that's pretty straightforward. And then Christmas, so that has a K, R, Kr, but that's not, that's too much in Hawaiian. So you get Kali rather than Kr to break up that, that sequence as well. So Hawaiian is like when you choose to eat lots of individual, tasty, smaller cheeseburgers rather than one big burger full of stuff. Yeah, it's kind of like the sliders of syllables. Like everything's just <laughs> a bunch of small open face sandwiches. And I think the important thing here is that like everyone still gets to eat plenty of burgers. Yeah, and it's interesting because there have been some studies that show that some languages have syllables that are smaller, that just have maybe maximum a consonant and a vowel, or a consonant and a vowel and a consonant and no more. And those languages tend to pronounce their syllables faster because there's less information in them. Whereas, uh, so a language like English, the most dense syllabled word in English is the word strengths, uh, which has got three at the beginning, S, T, R, and at the end it's got N, th, s. <laughs> Strengths. Three at the beginning, three at the end. That is a very large and full hamburger situation. Yeah, it's a very large and, and dense, you know, there's a lot of like toppings and stuff on this, <laughs> this hamburger. And so you say those a bit slower because they've got more information in them. So when you count by syllables, it seems like some languages are faster, but it's because they've got smaller syllables. So if you count by bit of information, they actually end up averaging out to about the same. I learnt Polish, which also is a language that allows a lot of stuff in a single syllable burger, but it allows different stuff to English. So hmm. it took a long time to get my head around that. So I know we don't normally try and apologize for how badly we speak languages on the show, but like I really do feel it's been a long time since I've worked out my Polish consonant cluster mouth. Um, so a word like vishtonch, which means shock, has multiple consonants before that vowel that we don't mm -hmm. normally put together in English. Yeah, I don't I don't even think I can produce it v chance. Yeah, yeah I, like I'm, I'm definitely good. dropping some of them just to just to try and make it fit within the kind of burgers that you're used to. Yeah, so I like one thing I could do if I was trying to say that is v chance, like I'm I'm going to drop one or I could say v chance and try to add a vowel in between to split it up. Yeah. A bit like Hawaiian speakers do with kalikimaka for Christmas. Yeah, exactly. Add a, add a vowel there. Uh, and English speakers, sometimes we drop stuff, sometimes we don't. You can see this in words that we've borrowed from other languages, like with helicopter. Um, you don't need to do that there because it's in the middle of the word. But in a word like pterodactyl, you just drop the P. Or psychology, you just drop the P there. Uh, or xylophone, which was originally xylophone, because that's what the sound an S ma X makes. Oh, yeah. I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because so you just get used to saying words how you say them. Yeah, exactly. So in French, for example, they've also borrowed these words from Greek, but French is more okay about saying those consonants at the beginning. So in French, you say like psychologie and xylophone. I don't know if you do it with xylophone, <laughs> xylophone, but you definitely say psychologie in French. You don't say psychologie. And uh, so sometimes in English we drop it, and sometimes in English we add another little vowel to kind of rescue 
all of the consonants. So in words from Russian, um, some English speakers can say things like Vlad and Ksenia, but a lot of times you'll get Vlad or Ksenia, Ksenia, in order to try to keep both of the consonants there. So a bit like Spanish speakers, Nepali speakers with school, we move that initial V in Vlad to its own Vlad syllable. Yeah, exactly, to try to try to say the whole thing. And, you know, and Japanese does this as well. So in an English loan word like picnic, because in Japanese they don't like consonants at the end of a syllable unless it's an N or an M. Um, so picnic becomes something like pikuniku because you want to have, you rescue those Ks by giving them their own, their own vowel. So the start and the end of a syllable have their own characteristics. We've kind of been talking around the kind of burger part and what can go before or after the burger, but that can differ. So with Japanese, you can only have a M or an N after that central part. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is one of the reasons I like a burger metaphor in particular, because, you know, a sandwich also has a central part with the filling and two pieces of bread. But what makes a burger distinct is that it's asymmetrical. You've got a top of a bun that's different in shape from the bottom of the bun. And languages often let you do different things with the start of the syllable than they let you do with the end of the syllable. Mm -hmm. So, and in many cases, the end of the syllable, you can't put as many consonants there. So sometimes you can only put a few, like M and N, or you can't put any, like in Hawaiian. Or in English, you can put the ng at the end of a syllable, but not at the beginning. Or you can put the H, the H, at the beginning of the syllable, but not the end. Yeah, we definitely can't put it at the end, as we discovered at the start of this episode. Nga! Nga! What a great word! Hang! Totally good word! Nga! Not a word. And half of English is the equivalent of like serving a burger with the bun upside down. <laughs> An English speaker would just be like, what is happening? Like, what have you done? <laughs> what have you done to my burger? This is, and like, it doesn't even sit right. It doesn't even sit on the plate. The top is curved, so it doesn't even sit there. It just kind of falls over. So it could be a perfectly good burger in many other languages, uh, a very confusing burger in English. Right. And so like what you think of as something that belongs on the top or what you think of as something belongs at the bottom. And I think there's also some room for kind of, you know, individual variation. Like, do you put the ketchup on the top bun or the bottom bun? I don't know. Um, but in general, like languages do have this asymmetric relationship between what can go before and after the vowel. And the vowel being that really central, it's hard to, you know, a, a burger without the patty in the middle is a salad roll. <laughs> Yeah, if you have, I was trying to think about this as well, you know, because you can just stress test your metaphors before you commit to them. And I was thinking, you know, back in the day when I was like a student and not very organized, and I was like a vegetarian, and I was trying to get enough protein, sometimes I would just eat like a veggie burger with like some carrot sticks or something, or a salad or whatever, because I wouldn't have the buns. And that's something you can do when you've still eaten, by some definition, something of a burger. But I think if I just had the bun by itself, I have not eaten a burger. No, you've eaten a roll. <laughs> you've just you've just eaten a roll. You've eaten a bun. By no definition, it's a burger. Whereas if you just eat the patty, you have kind of still eaten a burger, even though it's a very small burger. And overwhelmingly, when people talk about syllables, the vowel that's in the middle is a really central anchor point for almost all languages. Yeah, you need this kind of this anchor point of something to make the syllable. And it's generally a vowel, but it's not like 100% a vowel, because there are some words in English, for example, um, depending on how you pronounce a word like bottle, you probably say bot -l, and it's just really just an L. -l. You could say bottle, which might give you a vowel there. You could just say bot -l, or button, and that might just be the N, the N itself that's the second syllable, and there's no vowel to speak of. That N is the portobello mushroom of burgers. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's kind of the center of it, but you don't normally think of it as like a prototypical burger. Yeah. Um as a vegetarian, I am really sick of portobello mushrooms <laughs> as burgers, but as an as a language speaker, I love syllable nasals and syllable Ls. Well, and I also kind of think of so, you know, you can have in the middle one vowel, but you could also have several vowels. You could have something like bike has i, which is a diphthong which is kind of two vowels smushed together. So maybe that's kind of like a, a deconstructed burger or something that's got like multiple pieces inside of it. You can order two patties in a burger if you if you want a really meaty burger. Yeah. The other reason I really like this burger metaphor is that if you want to serve a burger with only one bun, you probably take the top one off because that's the one that's the weirder shape and you can still leave the bottom part of the bun and the, 
the patty part on your plate. And so there's also kind of a different relationship that this vowel has with the consonant or consonants that come after it versus the ones that come before. It's a very fancy restaurant that you're eating in if you have to use like cutlery to eat a topless burger. <laughs> you can have an open face sandwich. People don't often have like a an open foot sandwich? What's the opposite of an open face <laughs> sandwich where you only have the top? An open, an open bottom sandwich, which is I think why they don't say <laughs> sounds ridiculous and it looks ridiculous and it's even more ridiculous to eat. It's very messy. <laughs> Although it totally works fine for syllables. So we found the, finally the first thing where the, the metaphor really doesn't hold. Yeah, so the metaphor doesn't hold in the sense that you can have a syllable like ba, which doesn't have a bottom thing. Um, mm -hmm. But there is this closer relationship that the vowel has with anything that might come after it. Because when we talk about what are different kinds of like poetic devices you can do with languages or what are interesting kinds of like ways you can play around with sounds. So you can have things that rhyme, which means that the vowel and any consonants that come after are the same. Or you can have things that are alliteration, which means that just the initial consonants are the same. But you don't often get something where the first consonants and the vowel are the same, but the latter consonants are different as a poetic device. Obviously, we can do this, but we're not as, like, into it. Yeah. So you have bad, mad, sad, glad. These all rhyme. It's great. Excellent. Or you can have bad, big, ben, brigand, boxes. <laughs> and, you know, all these begin with B. You could make some sort of Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers sort of thing out of them. Yep. But bad, bat, bag, back, ban, <laughs> bat, they're technically more alliterative because they all have B and A, but we don't necessarily find them any more compelling than anything that was just a B at the start. Yeah, like the extra the extra vowel doesn't seem to gain us anything, as opposed to bad, mad, sad, glad, which is like, yeah, this is this is great. This is really doing something. Like now we're in a Dr. Seuss story. So satisfying. And we're really into rhyming as a poetic device in contemporary English. But Old English was really into alliteration. Yeah, in Old English, it's all about those initial consonant sounds, and they didn't really care about the ends. And this is a distinction that seems to be relevant in a lot of languages, the rhyming part of the syllable as compared to the onset part, which is just that initial set of consonant or consonants at the beginning. And you need to understand how this rhyme part works, not overtly, because obviously people can make rhymes without sitting there going, hmm, I must make sure that the vowel and the information following it is all the same in order to create a successful rhyme. But you see, even really young kids are great at understanding if something rhymes and also really good at pig Latin, which requires you to take the onset, so that top of the burger off, and then put it on the top of another new syllable burger, which ends in A. So I am terrible at pig latin <laughs> oh i did a lot as a kid so you have like pig latin becomes ig pay atin lay and that ig that's left over is your rhyme and then you've taken the onset the p and put it at the end but if you take so example my name gretchen and you put it into pig latin it's etchen gray because you've taken both the g and the r because that's the whole onset and put it at the end Having wretch and gay would be very bad. Pig, like I would not be pig Latining correctly. Yeah, that's not that's not how you pig Latin. Uh, so people are sensitive to this distinction, even though most people don't know the word onset or think about it in those terms. It's something that is very intuitive from a language game. And there's also Latin games like ibish or obish, where you put like ib or ob in between the onset and the rhyme. Uh, so in a word like Oh, I can't do this one at all. <laughs> um, so in a word like pig, you would say like pibig or something like that, or pobig. This makes me so much happier to know that the kind of on-the-fly processing that you need to do for things like pig Latin really are learnt behaviours, because you can't just immediately do it with another one. Yeah, I, I can do pig Latin really fast, and the other ones I like didn't learn as a kid. <laughs> So you've got to make sure that your kids acquire Pig Latin when they're young enough, because otherwise they'll never get them. <laughs> yeah, I missed the um, Pig Latin acquisition window, clearly. <laughs> I, I know, it's terrible. I missed the ibish uh acquisition window. But this is something people are really sensitive to, uh, and yet there's no like alternative version of Pig Latin where it's like, I don't even know how you would do it. So you have to be like, like 
P A G. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think. So, what if you take the last consonant and you put it at the beginning? G P. Uh, Latin would become ne lati. This this is just not a thing that language games do. I never had much luck learning Peak Latin, but understanding how syllables work has made me much more aware of how I'm going learning other languages when it comes to learn because we we focus a lot on like learning the sounds of a language, but it's rare to be explicitly taught how to combine those sounds into syllables. Yeah, I think that was something that I noticed when I was learning Arabic that I had to learn how to make this H at the end of the word uh, when I was learning German because they have not just uh, str, but you can also do something like schm, uh, which is less common in English oh, yeah. except in a few loan words. Another interesting example of this is in Dutch, where they have this combination of s, which is very straightforward, and h, like the you know German ch sound h. But together, it's like, and I just can't do it. <laughs> I've tried a lot. But there's a city, uh, and this is a very unique sound combination to Dutch, and there's this city, which I'm going to pronounce wrong, but it's like Schweningen, maybe. Uh, and this was used as a shibboleth mm -hmm. during the Second World War to distinguish between whether somebody oh. was Dutch or not. Uh, they would just get them to pronounce this name, because it's like really hard if you're not Dutch. And it's a bit like when I was learning Shuba and other Tibetan languages that have that initial ng sound. And I was, it was very frustrating to know I can make this sound. I've made it in English my whole language speaking life, but putting it at the start of the word suddenly becomes a, sh a challenge for the shape of the mouth. Yeah. It's this, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The combination of sounds is an additional thing that can be really interesting about language even apart from the individual sounds that are there. And just like it's fun to bring people to Australia and introduce them to burgers with beetroot in it, it's really fun when you learn a new language to figure out what combinations of sounds it allows. Yeah, and linguists have a lot of fun drawing diagrams to represent the information about, okay, what can go in the onset of the syllable, what can go in the rhyme, you know, how can we divide the rhyme further between the nucleus, which is the vowel, and the coda, which is the consonants that come after, you know, how can we represent this information in a way that makes it easier to talk about the differences and similarities between languages. Of course, diagrams are fun, but hamburgers are more fun. <laughs> Maybe linguists should draw their syllable diagrams as if they were actually hamburgers. New proposal. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. And I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. And my book about internet language is called Because Internet. To listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include animals, unique words that you use with your family, and direction words like right, left, north, and south in different languages. You can also sign up to the Lingphabet tier, where we will assign you your very own symbol of the International Phonetic Alphabet, based on our super scientific personality quiz, and add your name and symbol to our Lingthusiasm supporter wall of fame on our website. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella, and our editorial manager is Emily Greff. Our music is Ancient Cities by the Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!